Happy Wednesday! It's almost the weekend and it's almost the 4th of July. Who's excited? Me. Anyways, uh, life in the antebellum north is what we're talking about today. And if you have no idea what the word antebellum means, it just means before the war. Now, two things to talk about. Cities and religion. Because that's going to encompass a lot of what's going on in the north. Uh, first thing you need to know is the 40-year period before the Civil War is the most rapid period of urbanization in American history. Uh, New York City is the largest city. There's over 1 million people in New York City. The number of towns that have 2,500 residents, it's going to go from 56 to 350. It doesn't sound like a lot, but think about it in percentages. It's a several hundred percent increase. Uh, people don't just stay in cities. They move in and out all the time. Some the average turnover, uh, half the people move in and out of a city every 10 years. So if you are in New York City in 1820, there's a 25% chance you've gone by 1825 and a 100% chance almost that you're gone by 1830. People move in and out of cities constantly. Uh, the buildings are crowded. There are no high rises. There's no apartment buildings. You pretty much live wherever you can. There's no public water, there's no public sewer, there's only private companies. If you don't pay for your public water, your water's cut off. If you don't pay for your sewer, your sewer's cut off. There's no police protection, there's no fire protection either. Private companies again. So if you don't pay the night watchman and your house is broken into, he's going to walk right on by. Uh, there's lots of entertainment though. There's theater, there's sports, there's urban clubs, there's street gatherings, and there's political rallies. Political rallies were a big thing to go to. Shakespeare was performed everywhere. Uh, horse racing, boxing, running, baseball, all of that is going on and that's what people did in the North. This is also the first time where people live apart from their work. This is when that industrialization is happening. So people don't work out of their home anymore. They have to go someplace to work. The wealthy are going to start moving out of the cities because they want to move away from the population, they want to move away from the pollution, and they want to move away from the lower class people. They want to set themselves apart. Uh, you do get public transportation, mostly in the form of horse-drawn streetcars, but it does exist. And the rich are very, very rich. Uh, I've got an example there. New York City in 1845. The top 5% of New Yorkers owned 80% of the money. Uh, since it is the beginning of industrialization, we start to get this idea of mass production. Mass production is going to reduce the labor costs, it's going to lower the prices, and it's going to create new products. And then you also have the telegraph, which is going to allow news to spread much quicker than before, but it's also going to allow businesses to spread because now they can do um, orders you could be living in Chicago and order something from New York. Even the countryside gets industrialized. Uh, there's a guy named Cyrus McCormick. He invents the mechanical reaper for things like grain and oats. Uh, John Deere, he does not invent the tractor. I'm sorry if I broke your heart just then, but he invents something called the steel-tipped plow in 1837. That's important because the dirt or the soil in the Midwest, while it is really, really good soil, you have to go through a crust to get to it, and wooden plows couldn't get through the crust. Uh, Fertilizer is going to be invented and put to use, and then railroads are going to spread into the Midwest. And why is that important? Because farmers growing up in middle of nowhere Minnesota can send their stuff back east and sell it to markets. And your most important cities in the Midwest then, and I would argue now even, are Chicago and Milwaukee. Chicago is the third largest city in the country. It is a railroad mecca. If you've ever gone to Chicago, there are trains everywhere, and they're like mile-long trains. Milwaukee is really important as well, not just for beer, although that is good. Milwaukee is does almost as much business as Chicago does. And a lot of people down here don't realize this. Milwaukee is almost twice the size of the city of Atlanta. All right, let's talk about religion. I promised that for you too. Uh, you have this thing called the Second Great Awakening. Um, it begins around 1800 and goes into the 1830s. There's a guy named Lyman Beecher of Connecticut, Charles Finney of New York. Uh, and they're gonna kind of lead this. 
and it's all based really in the city of Rochester. Rochester, New York, I've been there, it's a pretty good town, it's nice, but pretty much in Rochester, uh, there was a section of the town where you could go everywhere and all they talk about is religion and they called it the burned over district because of all of the religious talk that's going on. Uh, the biggest thing about the Second Great Awakening is this idea of, of a revival. People like Lyman Beecher and Charles Finney, they felt like people had fallen away from religion. Lyman Beecher is trying to... Lyman Beecher, he was this guy from Connecticut, as I said, and he's going to argue against rum, and he's going to uh, be really uh, just anti-alcohol. He's going to talk about the issue of slavery, and he's going to be involved with the Oberlin College, which was in Ohio. Charles Finney, he's going to do a lot of things that were radical for the time, like allowing women to pray in public. Uh, he's going to be the one who creates the idea of the revival, and he's going to use common everyday language in his sermons. He also prayed for people by name, and he allowed people to immediately join his church. All of that was very different from what a lot of people do. Um, the Methodist church and the Baptist church that you think of today and are on every street corner, they are outgrowths, really, of this Second Great Awakening. There are some utopian movements, too. You've got the Mormons, founded by Joseph Smith. Uh, you've got... The Shakers, who are really weird too, um, and no offense if you're a Shaker, although I know you're not because they don't exist anymore. Uh, Mormons, uh, according to tradition, Joseph Smith finds a newly discovered book of the Bible called the Book of Mormon. Um, he's going to gain a lot of followers when he starts preaching about the Book of Mormon, but he's also going to gain a lot of enemies. Uh, he's going to be forced to move further and further west. He ends up in Pennsylvania, Ohio, and then eventually Illinois. He started actually, he actually is from Rochester, New York. Uh, in 1843, he says polygamy is a new revelation. The archangel came to him and said polygamy was okay. Uh, that's the big problem. But in 1844, Joseph Smith, he's going to be broken out of a jail in western Illinois, and he and his brother are going to be lynched by a mob. And then a man named Brigham Young is going to become the leader of the Mormons and take them to Utah. Uh, you, the Shakers, I mentioned them a second ago, um, they believe in this idea of perfectionism. They want to surrender all of their worldly properties. Uh, and they think that by surrendering all their worldly properties and believing in perfectionism that the kingdom of heaven will actually come to earth instead of them having to go to heaven. They also believe in absolute chastity, no sex. Don't even think about it. Stop doing it. That's kind of what killed them off. Because they couldn't make new shakers. Uh, they expected people to convert to them. And people were okay with most of it. But the chastity thing is where they were kind of like, no, I'm good. And shakers, they die out before the Civil War. You have a group called Transcendentalists. So I'm not going to talk too much about them. But if you've taken an American literature class, you're familiar with them. There are people like Henry David Thoreau and uh, Mary Louise Alcott. Uh, it's this philosophical movement where they believe in the goodness of people, the goodness of nature, and they thought that society could corrupt the individual. Somebody was at their absolute best when they were self-reliant, independent, and pure. The Transcendentalists are going to build this community called Brooks Farm that's outside of Boston in 1841. And everybody was supposed to do work equally, and it was thought if everybody shares in the labor, then everybody can share in the leisure time too. Well, it doesn't work the way they think. Tensions break out, people don't want to work together, and the farm is destroyed in 1847. Uh, they decide, you know what, this is kind of a disaster and they just they don't rebuild it now some of the people that lived there were Ralph Waldo Emerson Henry David Thoreau um, Louise Marie Alcott Bronson Alcott 
Um, all of these very famous American authors were involved in this transcendentalist movement. All right, reform movements. This is the other half of the religion reform part. Um, temperance movements. There was this big anti-alcohol movement that starts. They want to prevent Sunday alcohol sales, and part of this temperance movement still exists today. If you happen to live in a part of Metro Atlanta that doesn't allow Sunday alcohol sales, that goes all the way back to the 1820s. Uh, there's a woman named Dorothea Dix who is going to go around Massachusetts and she's going to tour prisons and report on their conditions and she's going to report that they're pretty bad. Uh, she finds that people are in cages, people are chained, people are beaten. And when she exposes this, it leads to humane treatment of prisoners, humane treatment of orphans, and humane treatment of people with special needs. Public education is going to come out of these northern reform movements before the Civil War. Uh, you get public school as early as 1800 in parts of New England, but they have spread nationwide by 1860. And a gentleman named Horace Mann, who was with the Boston Department of Education, or the Boston Division of Education, something like that, is considered the father of public school. Uh, and he says a well-educated population is essential to maintaining democracy. So he doesn't want people to learn to be learned. He wants people to learn because he thinks it makes them more democratic. Now, businessmen love public education because if you think about it, and this might make some of you mad, um, school, it teaches you to work hard and succeed. It teaches you to accept the instructions of your superiors. It teaches you not to envy the rich. And those were all things that businessmen were like, we can be on board with this because it makes better workers. Now, last but not least, we have the idea of abolition. Uh, the, the group of people who were rightfully fighting against slavery. Uh, the very first abolitionist group that's in the United States was the American Colonization Society. They were formed in 1817. And they wanted a gradual compensation, or gra uh, compensated emancipation is what I'm saying, and it was supposed to be gradual. Basically, when a owner died, all of those slaves would be freed, they would be given compensation for their labor, and then they could never become a slave again. A very famous person named William Lloyd Garrison is going to become one of the most outspoken proponents of abolition. He starts in a newspaper based in New York called The Liberator. And The Liberator is all about ending slavery. William Lloyd Garrison, he called for the immediate emancipation and immediate equal rights for blacks. He also argued, though, that Americans should stop supporting the government because the government was illegal and immoral because it allowed slavery to happen. There are some other groups out there too, and before I tell you about them, um, gotta give you today's secret word. Today's secret word is cartoon, C-A-R-T-O-O-N. Secret word is cartoon. You might be asking why, it's because the curse of the bubble guppies has continued yet still. That's the only thing my two-year-old wants to watch. I know the words of every song at this point. Please save me. So the word of the day for this lecture is cartoon. All right, continuing on with the abolition, just to let you know, there are some other groups that formed. There's the American Anti-Slavery Society in 1833. Unfortunately, it only, it only lasts for about five, six years, and that's because they can't decide if they should become a political party or not. And it splits into two. Half of it follows William Lloyd Garrison, who says we should stay out of politics, the government is illegal. And the other half say we should run people for office so we can change slavery from the inside. In the end, it's going to take a war, of course, to end slavery. It's going to take a war, of course, for abolition to come to fruition. All right, last thing I want to finish you up with is about the research paper. What I would like you to do this weekend is just start looking through the class. Find a topic, a person, or a thing that you're interested in learning more about. 
Then I want you to do a little bit of background research on more about that person. For example, maybe you're interested with William Lloyd Garrison. Go to Wikipedia, read a little bit about him. Look him up on the internet. Find out who he is and see if that's who you're really interested in. The next thing I want you to do is log into Galileo. You can do that through your Blackboard page. And just look up a couple articles about your person or your thing. Search William Lloyd Garrison in Galileo and see if there's material in there for him. If you can do that little bit of work this weekend in between your 4th of July celebrations, it'll put you miles ahead of where you need to be. You'll be on the right track. And when I come back with the Monday video to show you how to do research, you'll be a step ahead of the game. Until next week, enjoy your 4th, be safe, be socially distanced. We'll talk to you later. Bye.